Okay, so I would like to introduce to you now uh, Mr. Dario Radicic, Senior Data Science Consultant at NEOS, and the session title is Optimizing Cloud Costs with Machine Learning, a Cloud Vein Story. Will you tell us the story? Thank you. So, uh, hello everyone and thank you all for coming today. Uh, today I'll share you a story of Cloud Wayne, which is closely tied to optimizing cloud costs with machine learning. So, I need the... As mentioned before, my name is Ari Radicic and I'm a senior data science consultant in, at NEOS. So, uh, the first couple of minutes I would like to devote about, about NEOS as a company and uh, NEOS spin-off, which is uh, Cloud Wayne. So, as, as a company, NEOS was founded in 2002 and now has over uh, 20 years of experience uh, delivering uh, products and services related to data analytics, software engineering, and cloud and system infrastructure. We currently have over 140 certified consultants working in these, in these uh, three branches. And in the past 20 years, we had over 400 successful projects, some of them domestic and some of them worldwide. This is, this is a short list of our clients. Uh, we mostly work with big players in the areas of financial services, telecom industry, utilities, utilities insurance, and public sector. And uh, we mostly work with uh, these clients in all three of our departments because the same project often requires a combination of a system architecture, custom software, and a custom tailored uh, data analytics solution. Uh, the most, most of the companies you see listed here are either uh, major private or public uh, creation companies, but there are also some international players listed. And in, in addition to client work that I mentioned, we also wanted to tackle the issue of multi-cloud management, and that's where uh, Cloudway comes in. Uh, we are, as a company, uh, a company that utilizes a uh, multi-cloud approach, so we know uh, at first how, how challenging it can be to, uh, to dive into the world of multi-cloud, so I want to share with you some of the challenges that we faced. The first challenge, and probably the, the most major one, is user-driven consumption. What this means is that each uh, provisioned resource generates cost and usage data, and at the end of the business period, it generates uh, actual cost. Uh, what that means is that any, uh, any employee with a business credit card can uh, open a cloud account, uh, start provisioning resources, and can start generating costs. That can result in numerous uh, cloud bills, especially if we talk about multi-cloud environments where uh, a company can use multiple cloud vendors and have multiple cloud accounts open uh, with each of the vendors. And at the end of the month, this, this typically results in a millions of uh, rows of row usage and cost data. And if you maybe ever seen such a CSC file, then uh, you can know that Cons uh, that consolidation, especially if we discuss uh, multi-cloud environments where each cloud provider has its own set of, uh, let's say, distinct naming conventions and different rules, is easier said than done. Then we have the issue of optimization. Uh, cloud is significantly different from an on-premise environment, so you really want to use only the resources that you need and scale down or completely shut down the resources that you don't need. And doing this manually on a large scale is both challenging and time-consuming. You also want to map your resources so you know at all times who's using what and why. And again, in a large scale, in a multi-cloud environment, this is also very time-consuming. Uh, then we have the issue of complex cloud landscape, which essentially means that for a regular business person who isn't, uh, who isn't very tech-savvy, it can be challenging to keep up with all of the all of the new services, all of the new resource types, all of the new shapes that cloud providers are constantly coming up with. And to address all of these and many other challenges, we decided to develop a product called CloudWayne. In the most simple words, it's just a uh, multi-cloud management platform that allows you to connect, uh, monitor, and manage uh, multiple cloud accounts in one central place. 
What it really enables you is to track your cost and usage, so you can really dive deep into, into reports. You can eliminate the resources that you don't need and don't use, and you can sometimes even significantly eliminate cloud waste, and sometimes even up to 40%. You can also uh, manage security across organization, and maybe, most importantly, you can uh, make decisions and, and, and take actions in one central place instead of logging into dozens of cloud consoles manually. So what I mentioned so far is great for organizations that leverage multi-cloud architecture, but we still haven't touched on the idea of data science and machine learning. Uh, regarding Cloud Vane, if anyone is interested in how multi-cloud approach and Cloud Vane in general can, have, can help their business, a couple of us from NEOS will be available after the talk. Now I want to shift gears and, and focus on the reasons you're actually here, and that's the need for data science in a product such as Cloud Wayne. So as you would imagine, if you have uh, multiple cloud accounts open on multiple cloud providers, it, uh, the, amount of uh, the amount of data and the volume of data quickly piles up. If you're talking about cost data, uh, for, some uh, for some cloud providers, we typically have uh, a data point or a cost information for each resource for each given day. And some cloud providers even go as deep as individual hours of the day. Uh, utilization is pretty much a different story because across uh, all cloud providers, we have huge volumes of data uh, uh, coming down to individual minutes of the hour. So it's essential for us and CloudVane to clean and aggregate this data the best way possible for each use case in which machine learning can be applied. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see a couple of the use cases of CloudVane that depend on machine learning. The most important one and the feature that we spend the most time on are cost predictions. Uh, in the most simple words, you want to stay on top of your costs uh, because cost predictions allow you to see uh, uh, what, what your cloud expenditure is likely to look in the future. Here we're talking about either daily uh, predictions for the next month or monthly predictions for the, for the next year. Uh, we are also working on uh, right-sizing recommendation that's based on ut util utilization data. And here our, uh, our goal is to, uh, let's say, recommend you the right resource type and right resource shape based on your historic, historical usage patterns so you don't uh, spend money where you don't need it. We've also worked extensively uh, to pushing anomaly detection module to production, which is, again, ba based on cost uh, forecasting uh, on, on, on the cost data set. And regarding the cost data set itself, well, I don't want to go into methodologies yet. I will in a couple of slides, but the distinction I want to make now is that cost predictions are heavily dependent on time series algorithms, while anomaly detection is currently based on a mixture of supervised and unsupervised le learning techniques. So to recap everything we have so far, uh, we need cost and usage predictions because you want to stay on top of your costs. Uh, the more you use some resource, the more, you're, the more you'll pay for it at the end of the month. And if you can estimate or predict how, uh, how much uh, of something you'll, you'll spend, then you can stay on top, of the, uh, stop on top of your costs. And you can, once again, based on this cost data set, stay on top of your uh, anomalies and act on, act on them immediately and not uh, after you receive the bill. Regarding uh, utilization, predictions are important here because you want to use the optimal resource that you need and the optimal resource shape. Because, for example, if, you're, you, if you have some resource provisioned and you're using it extensively for some analysis, let's say at the end of the month, and you're using it in moderation for the remainder of the, of the month, then scaling it automatically up or down, uh, depending on your individual uh, usage patterns and, and you know, what part of the month is it, and maybe, uh, maybe a good way to save you some money in the long run. Now I'll, I will go a bit deeper into the whole story of cloud Wayne and machine learning. Uh, when we talk about data that's related to cost, let's say, you immediately can guess that it's going to be a, a time series task. Uh, that brings with itself two major issues. The first one, which is well, let's, let's just say closely related to the project, and the second one, which is related to the nature of, of time series algorithms. 
The first one, the one related to the project itself, is, in, is uncertainty. When you're developing some, some product and no one is using it uh, at the moment, you can't know for sure how many uh, clients will end up using that product and for each of the client, uh, how many cloud providers they're, they're, they will use in their multi-cloud environment and for each provider, how many cloud accounts they'll, they'll make and then the loop goes down and for each cloud account, how many resources they'll have. So uh, the only thing that's certain here in this uncertainty part is that we need a stable and scalable architecture that can support uh, all of that load. And in prediction terms, this means that we can't know beforehand uh, how much load the, will the prediction system have to support. So we need to plan in advance. And the second issue, as I said, is more or less connected to the nature of time series algorithms. If you aren't familiar, if you aren't familiar with them, well, they don't work exactly the same as, let's say, supervised learning algorithms. Uh, you, with time series, you really need to retrain the model with every uh, new data point that you get, because uh, for A, that's just how time series models works. And for B, uh, the latest data point in the historical data set that's available oftentimes has the most impact on the, on the predictions. So for that reason, and because speed is the key, a couple of years ago we decided to try in database machine learning, and here I'm talking about at the moment that was Oracle 19C database. Uh, we gave it a try. Uh, we tried out the time series algorithm that it has supported at the time, which was the entire exponential smoothing family of algorithms. Uh, this, the whole feature was relatively new at the time and was, and, and was still buggy, and the predictions overall weren't what we expected. Uh, we still think that, in general, in database machine learning uh, is a part of the future because you attack data where it lives, so you lose the entire bottleneck of moving, moving data around, which for some project, uh, the time can really pile up. And for, uh, for these reasons, we, uh, we ditched the database uh, story altogether and switched entirely to Python. And now when we were, let's say, calculating cost predictions in Python, we had access to pretty much any learning algorithm which we can imagine, from, let's say, simple moving averages to complex neural networks. But the whole story still had to work fast, so we needed to, let's say, be smart about our decisions and not to train something that doesn't need training. So uh, we ultimately opted for a mixture of, let's say, algorithms. Not all of them are tied to learning. So if, for some research, the client has only one data point available, so he or she provis provisioned it today or yesterday, then the, there's no point in even considering machine learning because you have no historical data available. So in these cases, when we have one data point, two data points, or may maybe a handful of data points, uh, we found through experimentation and analysis that a simple uh, averaging of, of that time series data will probably yield the, the best quote predictions, and in this phase, the user can actually expect this sort of, let's say, bad quality predictions be because he's been using the resource for so shortly, it makes no sense to, uh, to let's say, have accurate predictions for the next 30 days. In any case, when we have uh, multiple data points available, let's say a couple of weeks to maybe a month or two, we can attack the problem with uh, time series algorithms. And here we found out that exponential smoothing does pretty much the, the best job at, at modeling this time series because it's, it's really fast. And uh, typically, uh, when user uses something for a couple of weeks, he can see, let's say, a trend or seasonality components in his, uh, in his historical data, and he expects the predictions to accommodate that. In any other case, when we have months of historical data available, there's no reason why we shouldn't formulate the entire uh, data set as a regression task and attack the, uh, and attack the data set with, let's say, a regression algorithm such as gradient boosting. And here it's essential to have a good amount of data available because uh, one of the most important features to make regression work on time series data set are lag variables. So if you have 
uh, let's say, three months of historical data, and you want to introduce 30 leg variables to your data set to feature engineer those, let's say, 30 features, you immediately lose one month of historical data. You lose the first month because you can't calculate the, the leg features for them. But the leg features seem, uh, seem to be uh, really essential and have uh, and prove to have uh, great predictive power once we have some good amount of data available. Uh, the other reason why it's useful to formulate a time series task as a regression task is because you can feature engineer so many useful attributes from the date column alone. So if you have data for every day of the month or every hour of the day, then you can engineer features such as, is it a work day? Is it the end of the week, end of the month, end of some business period? Is it, uh, let's say, a work hour? Is it a holiday? And so on. You can probably extract dozens of useful features uh, from the data alone. And a good regression algorithm, when supplied with uh, adequate amount of data, won't have any problem returning us a quality set of predictions. So I think we can all agree here that the learning part or the machine learning part here is quite straightforward once you do the initial analysis and see what works and uh, what doesn't work for your specific use case. In practice, the whole machine learning pipeline can boil down to the diagram you see on the, sc on the screen now. So the user in this context is just another Cloudwain API that's responsible for collecting uh, new historical data. And as soon as the new data is collected, that microservice makes an API request to our uh, predictions API. And I'll go into details what's really behind this predictions API in a couple of slides. But for now, let's just think of it as a, as a piece of code responsible for uh, fetching the latest historical data set chunk from the database, uh, preparing that, that data, deci deciding on the strategy regarding uh, predictions, training the model, and then finally returning forecasts and writing them back to the database. The user also can know at all times what's the state of the individual prediction task. So the user knows when the predictions were written to the, to the database, or if anything goes south, the user can raise some alerts or and pretty much do anything else. So that's the general idea behind uh, machine learning on a product such as Cloudwain. But the issue that now remains is how to make Python work at scale. So at this point, we had to decide on the tools and technologies we want to use to make, to make Python scalable. As I'm sure many of you here know that making uh, an asynchronous API in Python is, well, it involves some manual work. So for our tech stack, we decided to go with the Oracle database for storing historical data and predictions. And what makes those, those predictions uh, is is Python REST API and Worker. So these are two uh, distinct Python services. The first one, the API one, only accepts API requests from the, from the user or the mentioned another uh, cloud name microservice. And the other uh, Python service is responsible for working on these individual prediction task, tasks at the same time. And now we need something to connect these two Python, uh, these two Python services. And we opted for a Redis in-memory database, which we used as a queue. If this seems a bit abstract, I think the diagram on the following slide will paint you the full picture. So on the most left side, we have the Python I API. It's based on the uh, Fast API library and the Oracle database. Its job is simply to uh, to accept requests uh, that have some data uh, in them. And this data is typically everything that's needed to, identi to identify some resource in the database. So for example, this would be information about cloud provider, uh, about the cloud account, and then the resource itself. And when the Python API gets uh, that request data, it's just, it just offloads it to a Redis queue. Then we have Python workers. Uh, whose job is to essentially dequeue a Redis queue and work on each individual prediction task in a parallel manner. For the, uh, this working in parallel manner, we opted for the Python Celery library because it allowed us to, uh, well, 
easily uh, have uh, multiple prediction tasks working at once. And when we need uh, more, s more speed or more workers, we can simply add them. And finally, the, the final job of the Python workers is to write back the predictions generated back to the Oracle database. So, so this really was behind the API part. And uh, regarding the next step, well, Cloudvan is still in active development. We're working on pushing anomaly detection and right-sizing recommendation system uh, to production. Uh, regarding actual machine learning here, I can't really tell much. But uh, from what I've seen so far and from what we've tested, I can uh, we certainly tell that the current Python architecture uh, will have no trouble supporting these two additional models and have them working at scale. And that's pretty much the story of Cloudwain regarding, uh, regarding data science and machine learning. And I would like to devote the time we have remaining for a Q&A session. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. So do we have any questions for Dario? Please. Uh, okay, uh, s at some point uh, on the slides you mentioned that uh, you're changing the, uh, the algorithms uh, when the volume of the data comes from uh, lower to medium to high. Does it, uh, does it uh, occur automatically? Or you just uh, define it at the beginning whether you have a low volume of data and do the uh, averaging and uh, move up to the faster? faster no, uh, we can't know uh, how much data will be available at any time. So what we did is uh, when a new call to the prediction API is made, the API first checks uh, how many historical data points are available for the resource. And then it's, it's just simple thresholding if, if uh, there are no, if, if there's not a lot of data points available, do this. And if it's something in between, do that. And if we have huge volumes of data, do the boosting. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? Over there, please. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, do you support multi-tenancy? Uh, at this time, yes. OK. And you collect all the data from all the cloud providers on your own systems, or do you require the clients or the users of the platform to collect the data based on the structure that you impose? So the story goes down like this. Uh, the user adds uh, cloud providers, tenancies, and what's so not to the Cloudwain console through the uh, different menus for adding our cloud accounts on and what's so not. And then as, as soon as uh, the user has done that, we can be begin collecting data from the beginning of, of the resources lifecycle for, for everything that he has provisioned for everything that's added. So it doesn't start at this point when the user has uh, added the cloud account, let's say, but we can go as, as, fa as far and fetch, fetch the whole history. So we can give some actionable, actionable insights or valuable predictions from day one, let's say. Okay, thank you.